and we're glad to have the mothers too. <laughs> Let's open our hymnals to number 83. Number 83, and if you would, those that can and will stand as we sing together, this is My Father's World. This is my father's world, and in my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world, I rest me. and trees of skies and seas his hand the wonders wrought this is my father's world the birds a carols raise the morning light the lily white declares a maker's praise. This is my father's world. He shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems all so strong, God is a ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Us who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Amen. Let's remain standing now for the invocation. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that this is your world. This is the world that you created. You give us the pleasure, the privilege to live on. Father, I pray, Lord, thank you for being the great creator, for creating us in your image, in your likeness. May, Father, Lord, we learn to live every day just a little bit better than the day before, to be a better Christian, to walk closer to you than the day before in this, your world. Father, I also thank you for Father's Day, time we recognize fathers. Lord, I just thank you, dear God, for the Father's Lord that we have in this church and also for the mothers. Lord, we didn't get to be with you, with, with the ladies when it was Mother's Day, but Father, Lord, we're so thankful that we can celebrate both today. Now, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, continue to bless uh, Lord Sister Lucille's family, Teresa and Mike, and the kids, grandkids. Lord, give them the strength that they need. Father, I pray for those who are not with us today because of illness, because of problems, whatever the need, the need are. I pray, Lord, that you would wrap your arms of love around them and uh, show them the way that Holy Spirit is taking care of them. Now, Father, Lord, go with us through this service. We praise you and we thank you for all things. In Christ's name, amen. Let's open our hymnals now to number 413. As we honor our fathers, you may remain seated as we sing together faith of our fathers 413 <clears throat> faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword oh how our hearts beat high with Whenever we hear the glorious 
Yesterday was Lucille's birthday. What a better birthday present could you have than to go home to be with the Lord? And, uh, this is time we normally take offerings, but offering plates are in the back and front. And uh, since they don't want us to hand out anything or pass out anything, so there, there they are. If you got your tithes and offerings, please leave them there. Bulletins and uh, and message uh, notes on the back table back there on the back stand. So if you haven't got one, go back there and get it. But it, uh, let's uh, remember and pray that uh, the governor will make the right decision Thursday and maybe open our churches back up totally without any restrictions unless it's the wearing the mask and whatever that uh, you want to do personally. So uh, let's pray much about that as well. Brother Harry, would you and Sister Becky have a song? I 
Jesus is living in me. Amen. Tell you what, if it wasn't for Jesus, you know where we'd be, don't you? We'd be in bad shape. If it wasn't for him and his sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, we'd be in hell today. That's where we all deserve to be. For Christ died on that cross to save us from there. And we can enjoy his presence day by day. Brother Jack, y'all got a song? You and Deborah? The title of this song is Just When I Need Him Most. The Lord is always there when we need Him the most, but He's there when we don't think we need Him. Amen. And hope you enjoy the words of this song, Just When I Need Him Most. <coughs> Just when I need Him, Jesus is me. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most, just when Just when I need 
and I need him every day, all day long. Thank you, Brother Jack. A beautiful day God's blessed us with okay. amongst all the trials and tribulations and problems of this earth. He still lets the sun shine. He lets the S-U-N shine and he lets the, the uh, S-O-N shine. So uh, I hope he's, Christ is shining in your heart today. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. We'll read the first 14 verses. We will attempt in the next two weeks, this Sunday and next Sunday, to answer that question asked of Christ by the disciples and when will the end of the world come and Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the, te of the temple and Jesus said unto them see ye not all these things verily I say unto you there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Let me just insert right here. And I think probably the disciples had their eyes on the wrong thing. The temple was a very beautiful place, marvelous. I mean, if, if you can imagine all the gold and all the tapestry and the jewels and everything that made up the, the uh, temple, how pretty and how beautiful and wonderful it must be. But Christ changed their way of thinking from it being beautiful to it being destroyed. And of course, we know that shortly after Christ's death, not too long after his death and ascension, the, tabard, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. Sometimes I wonder if we don't look at the beauty of this world and forget the Creator. Sometimes I think we look at the blessings and forget the one who is our benefactor. That's basically what the disciples were doing. Verse 3, And as he said on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us when these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take ye heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And I shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you to be afflicted, and shall, be, and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated among all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this is the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. We live in perilous times. We're living in times that you and I have never dreamed that would happen. You and I have never seen on the scope of this world the evil, the sin, the iniquity, the unrighteousness, that we're seeing today. One of the most asked questions of me in these troublesome times is when will Christ return? 
We've heard all of our life that Christ is coming. He is. He is. I believe Apostle Paul, when he talked about Christ's return, believed that he could return in his own lifetime. And he could have. I go places and sit at restaurants and I hear people dis discussing when will Christ come? When's the end of the world? When's the end of the age? But let me say this too. I've never been so excited to live that I have today. I think you and I who are saved by grace and living in the age of grace are of all people most blessed because we can see the nearness of our salvation. We can see the nearness of our eternity. And he is coming. With all the events happening around us, and I need not name them, all around the world, people are, it's causing people to ask, when will the end of the world come? And as we read in our text, nearly 2,000 or 2,000 years ago, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, when shall the end of the world come? I think we ought to talk about it publicly, that he's coming. One would think the people that are of aged, raised in America, in America that was founded on Christian principles, and godly practices. You would think people who are in their latter years of their 70s and 80s, with all the churches around us, with all the things going on around us, right here in Martinsville and Henry County and throughout the world, you would think that the people of those ages would know something about the return of Christ. I sat at a restaurant this week and heard a couple, well, there was two, two couples there at the same table, and they were discussing this exact thing, when will the end of time come? And you could tell from their conversation that the first thing they needed to ask is, who is Jesus? Because they were sort of sarcastic of the fact that we believe that Christ is coming. And these were probably people in their 80s and knew nothing about the Word of God. Sad. It's very, very sad. But Jesus is coming. You may disagree or agree, which is your right, with this message. I preach this message with a heart of love and directly from the Word of God, directly from the pages of this book, from the lips of our Savior, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I hope that this message will be received and accepted in a godly manner which it is given. Christ said of his Father in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. This word is true. Whether you accept it or reject it, it doesn't matter. It's still God-breathed, God-inspired, and it is truth. We're going to deny it. Listen to the next verse. Jesus said of himself in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't look good enough to go to heaven. You can't be rich enough to go to heaven. You can't do anything in your own power to go to heaven except, except Jesus Christ except Jesus Christ. So we have the fact that the word is true and Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life and nobody gets to the Father but by him. 
but Christ also takes the time in the book of John, John 8, 44, to say this. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth, not in the word, not in Christ, because there is no truth in him, and when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Paul writes Christ's words in Romans 3, 3, God forbid, yet let God be true and every man a liar. The question is, which one will you believe? I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe Jesus Christ. I'm going to believe their word. You see, God cannot lie. It's impossible for God to lie. But the devil does it all the time. And if you're not careful, you Christians, we Christians, he'll lie to us if we listen. The Holy Spirit will teach us differently if he's living in our heart and he is in the heart of all born-again believers. So Jesus is coming. Why? Christ said so. Why? The Word of God says so. And because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by him. Before I try to answer the question, there's a couple of things I need to talk about. Things that are mentioned in the Word of God. The fact, the one thing, the fact is, Jesus is coming. It's not something that some preacher, some theologian, some Bible scholar, some Bible teacher hacked up. It's not some version of the Bible that brought in the fact. It is the word of God that Jesus is coming. First of all, he said so himself. Secondly, he tells us in the book of Acts that he's coming. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 through 11. And when he had spoken these things while they were beheld, he was taken up and in the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, stood there, behold two men stood by them in white apparel, which, said unto, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. I believe those two men of white power were angelic beings, telling not only those people that were standing there on the mountainside as they watched him descend, as they looked and continually looked and continually looked, these two angelic beings says, get your, he your head out of the sky and on the people of this earth. Stargazing and heavenly gazing is not going to get people saved. What is? Get your eyes on the prize. Jesus is coming. Paul writes to Titus and says this, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I said, told you a while ago, I think we're living in the best time in the world in the time that Christ is going to come. And I believe he could come today. I believe that's how close it is. Therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour you think not the Son of Man cometh. As you can see all the trials and all the tribulations and all the things that surrounds us, as we will give you the signs in just a little bit or part of them today, the decision is yours whether you're here in this building this morning or whether you're watching by television or by website or Facebook, the decision is yours. He says, be therefore also ready for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. There's not a lot of people looking. There's not a lot of people looking. That doesn't change anything, Brother Jack. He's coming. And to us, he's a glorious hope. He's the blessed hope. 
He's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's our Creator, our Redeemer, our Savior. So Jesus is coming. Just put that down. Make sure you understand Jesus is coming. The second thing is the church had just been founded. When we were reading in Matthew 24, the church has just been founded and was growing in doctrinal truths. And one of those is the doctrine of the rapture. I said the other day, aren't you glad, or the other week, I said, aren't you glad that you didn't know it all when you got saved, but you grow in grace? You see, the church had just been founded over in 1618 of Matthew, and, and God had just created the church, the bride of Christ. And so they were growing in spiritual truths or in biblical truths or in doctrinal truths. And one of the great things that they learned and grew was the doctrine of the rapture, which God gave instructions to Apostle Paul to share with us. And Apostle Paul done so in three places, and he says this is the mystery of the church. The mystery of the church. He gave it to us in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and John also talked about it in Revelations 4. The rapture, the snatching away, the taking out. And I'm going to tell you this, I'm so glad that I know I'm going and not be left behind. You see, what we're going to find out once we leave this world, and pardon the use of this word, but it's used Scripturally, all hell will break loose on this earth. It will not be retained by walls. It will not be retained by fire. But when Holy Spirit, him that would let, does let, and when he's lifted up as we are, then everything evil will happen. Everything evil will happen. We cannot imagine in our minds what will be going on and we read the book of Revelations. We taught the book of Revelations, but I've never seen it more clearly than we do now. We might all go back and teach and preach the book of Revelations again, as, as close as I think it is. It's the mystery of the church. Now, this brings up to Bible scholars three things, which is much and often talked about. Whether Christ, when he comes, will come before or in the middle of or after the great tribulation. You see, the Great Tribulation is seven years of evil manifesting itself on this earth. Then comes the millennial, the thousand-year rule and reign with Christ. The, 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 the proper theological title for these three things is pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. Before, in the middle of, or after. You say, Pastor, what do you believe? I believe in pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I don't believe that the church will go through any of the wrath of God. We may see it. We will see it. But God tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9, much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. From the wrath of God that turns out turns evil loose on this earth. You think we're going through something now? We haven't seen anything close to it. I can't imagine. I can't tell you. My vocabulary is not that big to tell you what's going to be happening. But I know this. We're probably going to see some signs of his return. We're not going to go through it. You know, I have preached and taught on the rapture of the church many times. And I'm sure we'll be teaching it again soon. Christ tells us of his return in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36. But of that day and hour know no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. I can't tell you the minute, the hour, the day that Christ is coming, but I can tell you I know when he's coming. You say, that sounds like you're playing one against the other. 
No, I cannot tell you the second, the minute, the hour, the day, the week, the year. But I know when he's coming. It's when he looks over, when God the Father looks over at God the Son and said, go get my children. That's when he's coming. That's when he's coming. He also introduces to us the certainty of the great tribulation. Matthew 24, 21, For then thou shalt be a great tribulation, as there had not been since the beginning of time, no, nor shall they ever be. It will be the worst time ever on planet Earth. The worst time. I was watching NASA, and I like to watch these NASA programs and what they're doing at the Space Center, uh, up, up there, whatever that's called. And they were talking about how pretty and blue and how wonderful it is to see Earth from outer space. And then one of the astronauts said, the only thing wrong with this picture is there's too much fire. We can see fires all over the Earth. We can see all the burning in the right that, that comes from, from all these towns where they're burning up stuff. He says, it's too much. I want to tell you this. He might think it's too much, and it is too much, but it's just the beginning of what's going to happen. Now let's return to our text and try to answer the question, when will the end of time come, or when will the end of the world come? We see this text that there's signs of his coming, in which people, you and I, can see happening all around, all around us. Even though I said I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture, I do believe that you and I can, will, and are seeing the signs of his return. The first sign of his return is the sign of deception. Is the sign of deception. In verse 4 and 5, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. They come to mislead the mind and the hearts of people. They come to cause error and to cause belief or, 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 or to cause non-believing and cause us to believe, to cause people to believe what is false disbelieve the truth, to rob them of, of godly knowledge and from turning one away from the, God, from the knowledge of the truth. Christ said of this deception that it would get so bad if it were, uh, if it were possible to deceive the very elect, the very ones as he's been saved by his grace, if it would be possible. It's not possible to deceive the saved of God those people who don't know Christ as their Savior, who's never been taught correct doctrine, who's never been taught the Word of God as the Word of God is, will and can be deceived. And I think they're being deceived today. Deception is all around us. There's more false teachers, false doctrine, and teaching which is so close to the truth and close to the true church. If you don't have a correct Christian teaching, one can be deceived and are being deceived by them. The closer false teaching is to the truth, the more dangerous it is. Back when we was teaching through the book of Proverbs and we didn't finish it, I have to go back sometime and finish that, that lesson, that, that teaching. There's churches all around us that say they're Christian and they're not. They say they believe Christ and they don't. I mean, Christ has to be first and foremost in the life of the church or he's not there. And I don't have time to go into what a false church is, what a deceptive church is. And y'all know my feelings and my teachings on that. But the closer to the truth it is, the more dangerous it is. And if very possible, if possible, they would deserve the, that uh, they would deceive the very saved of God so be careful who you listen to. Be careful the people that's on television and radio. 
Be careful of the churches in our area who are deceptive, and they are. There's churches right here in our area, in Martin Henry County, that's preaching deception. You see, anything that somebody preaches that is not by grace through faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ to get them to heaven is a false doctrine. If you have to do anything to go to heaven, it's a false doctrine. But you see, the reason I know that is because I had no sense of knowledge and I had no way to know the love of God until he showed his love to me. You see, we love him because he first loved us. So be careful. There's signs of deception everywhere. I know a man that I know personally, very good man. Oh, when it comes to goodness, he couldn't be matched. When it comes to, to, to faithfulness to his church, he couldn't be matched. But I heard him in a conversation that I was in with him and several other people. He talked about Jesus. He talked about somebody else in their church that was more important than Jesus more highly thought of than Jesus. And Jesus was simply one way to one level in heaven. I want to tell you that's a deception and many are following it. We see the sign of false Christ. Verse 24 and 25. For there shall, be, for there shall arise false Christ, false prophets, which shall show the signs and wonders insomuch that if it would be possible he, that you would deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. False Christ. Those people who claim to be the Messiah. False prophets, those who teach the doctrines of false churches, who begin and start false churches, pretending to be a way of deliverance from whatever the problem is that they're having. There was one very popular false teacher, and I'm not going to name him, but he says that he's coming in the form of Christ. And he said that Christ has appeared with him in his body, in his body, this prophet's body, to tell people uh, that he's Christ. Now, I don't know where this man gets all this weird stuff, but thousands upon thousands and hundreds of thousands of people follow this man in this church. You see, Christ is not going to appear into this body no more than the fact that he already has through the person of the Holy Spirit. False people claiming great signs and wonders that is, they shall pretend to work the work of Christ and pretend to work miracles. Josephus said of these people back when he was writing, and if you've never read much of Josephus' writing, you should, in, you should take time to do so. You should endeavor to do so. It's very light, eye-opening, it's very enlightening, but it's a little hard reading. He said there would be magicians and sorcerers in his day that would lead people into the desert of this world and deliver them, supposedly deliver them from sickness, but come back without them. One of the great things happening today in the, the world of deception and the world of false prophets around us is that you don't get anything for free. You don't get anything in religious worlds for free, in the false doctrinal churches for free. It's always somebody who's on television, and you can watch the Inspiration Channel for just a little bit, and you'll see it. I don't, unless you're grounded and rooted and grounded in the Word of God and very stable, I don't, watch, I don't encourage you to watch it. But if you're an aged Christian, knows Christ as your Savior, just watch it and see. These, pre, these doctors, it's the doctors of religion that comes on there and says, if you will just send me some money, I will send you a piece of clothing or cloth that I have worn or that I have prayed over. Maybe I've anointed it with some holy water. 
and thousands of dollars are being sent to this false church and a false preacher. I mean, it's all, and, and that's just a little bit of things. Send me some seed money and, and God will bless you tenfold. I want to tell you something. If anybody wants anything from you for your salvation or for blessings from God, mark them up real quick as who they are. They're deceptors. They're false gods. They're false teachers. They're false Christ. One more. We have the sign of rumors of wars and rumors of wars. In verse 6, And ye shall hear the wars and rumors of wars, and shall see that, that excuse me, see that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, and then the end will yet, and the end is not yet. Wars, rumors of war. Since the beginning of nations, building nations, there's been wars between people, between nations. All through the Old Testament, you can find it. I've done a little research just to see, just to, for my own benefit, but also for yours now. There's five major wars going on right now and many more wars and conflicts around the world. This is evidence, this, this, is, this is information I got this week. There's currently more than 55 wars or skirmishes amongst people in which 1,000 people almost died last year. Almost 1,000 people died in wars in skirmishes around this world, wars and rumors of wars. It's awful. It's, her it's terrible. It's horrible what's going on. Men killing men. And then we have the promise of the sign of famines. Revelation chapter 6 and verse 5 and 6. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and a black horse to a black horse, and he that sat on it had a power of balances in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and there shall not be no hurt or oil to the wine. During the great tribulational period, and it's even almost today. There's famines. There's famines around the world today. There's people who wish they could have one slice of bread a day, just maybe one cup of rice a day, but they can't. You see, a penny in, in spiritual speaking is equal to one day's wage, one day of pay. People are starving. People wish they had something to eat. People are thirsting for water. I mean, literal water that we take for granted. Children are going hungry around the world. And it's not God's will that children go hungry. It's the work of the devil. It's the work of evil that causes that to happen. But there's a bigger famine than that of food. There's a greater famine going on in this world today than food. For Amos tells us in chapter 8 and verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine into, in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of a thirst for water, but of a hearing of the words of the Lord. People are preaching the word. Preachers are teaching grace. People are teaching salvation. But people are not listening. People are not hearing what we are saying. Why? Wow, they turn a deaf ear, as the Word of God says they would, to the preaching of the Word of God. Next week we'll get into this a little bit further. And we'll talk about the signs 
that are still left of pestilence and earthquakes and hate. Y'all pray much during this week because next week we get into current events that's going on. Pray much. We'll pick up here with pestilence next week. This has been a tremendous message to preach. The Word of God is true, and sometimes we as Christians find it hard to accept. Let me say this in closing. What's going on around us, the hatred, the violence, the rioting, the looting, the lies, they're all of the devil. They're all of Satan. And they're sent here to deceive and to destroy mankind. They sent here to prevent you who don't know Christ as their Savior from hearing the message. Let's pray much for our nation, our country. Let's pray much for what's happening in the streets of America. Let's pray much for Christians who understand that their time on earth is short and Jesus is coming. And I would say to you, as I'll say next week, we need to, with Apostle John, say, even so come, Lord Jesus. Brother Jack.